just before the meeting, I was at the expo. It, it really looks nice. And to see the leaderboard. Yeah. Who's on the top now? Did you see? Yeah, I saw it. It's a lady and quite, quite alone at the top. Uh, number two uh, will need several hundreds of clicks, uh, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I will wait one more minute and then start slowly and then see as more people will come in, probably. At least that's the experience of the, of the past days. Do, do we close at 1.20 p.m., right? Um, I think this session closes at 1. Yeah. 1. Okay. Yeah. And then I think uh, Rob, uh, Rob Carrillo will take over uh, in, in, in closing session. Yeah. That's a good right. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> Okay, it's 31 now. I slowly start with the introduction. Uh, welcome to this uh, EOSC in practice session. Uh, my name is Ron Decker. I'm the director of CESDA and I will be uh, moderating this, uh, this session. Uh, we will have the research community's perspective um, and discuss uh, how EOSC works or should work in practice. Uh, we will have thematic and interdisciplinary research communities uh, joining in this session and they are asked to, to address the opportunities and challenges in their research now, but also in 10 years from now, and then see how EOS uh, can support. Uh, we hope to discuss um, what are the, the practical obstacles that, that hamper the, the users, the user communities to make optimal use of, uh, of EOSC. Uh, and it can be either as an end user or as a, as a contrib contributor of, of material, for example, as a, as a data provider. We will have six uh, speakers uh, and they will kick off in a, in a minute. Uh, giving a pitch on how they are doing research currently. And then we will have um, uh, a Slido with some, some questions. And then we move uh, to, the, to, to the future to, to in 10 years from now. Um, so we will, I will introduce each speaker uh, as we go through the agenda. Um, perhaps we can have the house rules uh, back on the on the slide. So yes, there will be a recording. Also a request to stay muted um, and uh, keep the video off. And you can ask questions in. Uh, I will try to keep up with the Q and A and the and the chat uh, uh, box. So then back to the agenda. We will start with uh, EOS can practice. What are the, these six research communities uh, currently doing? Um, and we move on to the first speaker, which is uh, Slava Tikhonov. These are the six speaker, speakers, uh, Slava Tikhonov from Dance, Ami Sanji from Science Po, uh, Kees van der Rijk from Nottingham, Emiliano Deglienicenti from CNR, Alberto Meloni from Resilience, and Jennifer Edmund from Daria and Shape Idea, amongst others. Um, perhaps we will move now to the first speaker. Um, Slava Tikhonov uh, discussing the Corona Y community. 
Slava is a senior information specialist at uh, DANS, uh, one of the Dutch uh, data service providers in social sciences. And he is serving as a lead developer in the SHOC uh, project on Dataverse EU. Slava, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you, Ron. So I'm going to tell you something about coronavirus community and uh, the idea of his community uh, to fight against COVID-19 spread. So basically, uh, when it all started in March in Europe, uh, nobody knew what, what to do. And people just started to think how to work together and uh, what, what they can do uh, and uh, how actually to apply all this knowledge that they already have to fight against this uh, disease. So um, coronavirus community was created in March and uh, a lot of people came like a few hundreds came first days and uh, after even more people joined and uh, now we have really global research collaboration between scientific institutions and commercial companies. And the idea is to apply artificial intelligence uh, to recognize um, interesting insights and ex actually to use all, uh, all this information as knowledge graph and uh, make possibility for all communities to work together on this. Next slide, please. So what we did, um, as you know, we, we are working on Dataverse um, for shock, and uh, we already have prototype um, uh, of Dataverse that can be deployed on cloud, on Kubernetes. And uh, basically, when I joined this community, we deployed uh, this Dataverse for CoronaVai, and it was used as an integration point. So all people that joined, they started to use Dataverse to exchange information, and they learned how to use Harvard Data Commons, for example, uh, to support their work workflows, to change information, to make their fa data fair. And also uh, we started to create uh, vertical teams. So it was really open collaboration and all people from all parts of the world, uh, they joined. And uh, it's really easy to change information when you have this common uh, knowledge space. So uh, when new teams are coming now, they are also getting uh, own containers in Dataverse and they're starting to deposit data. And we also, at some point we decided, okay, so we have quite some data and can we actually harvest those data from open sources like, like uh, GitHub? And we created a harvester that uh, can actually get um, all data sets collected from GitHub. And uh, we started to deposit directly in Dataverse with some metadata description. And now we are working on artificial intelligence that can actually standardize all variables that we'll find in data files to make it available for all our uh, people. So thanks, that's it. Yeah, thank you, Slava. Um, we move on to the next pitch that is by uh, Ami Salji. She's a re researcher based at uh, Sciences Po in Paris. Uh, and she supports the, the shock project in making quantitative data on ethnic and migration, migrant uh, minorities uh, fair. Ami holds a master in uh, public administration from uh, London School of Economics and a BA in international studies from Ohio State University. Ami, the floor is yours. Thanks, Ron, for the warm welcome and for the very nice introduction. So as Ron mentioned, I'm here today on behalf of the Ethnic and Migration Studies data community of SHOCK. So I hope to share with all of you our take on EF, especially in terms of how it can support us as a data community. So a quick introduction about who we are as a data community. We bring together all different types of stakeholders of quantitative surveys undertaken with ethnic and migrant minority populations, which we refer to as EMM for short. And so what we have as part of our data community is data producers, data users, data queued creators and managers of EMM survey data regularly and intimately collaborating with one another. And collectively, what we want to do is make EMM survey data fair. And we're tackling this through three key research questions. First, how can we untap the full potential of EMM survey data for research and policymaking? What are the main challenges of actually accessing and reusing EMM survey data? And then what can we do as a data community to help make EMM survey data fair? And with these research questions in mind, it has led us to develop a work plan that involves developing free online tools that are user-friendly and user-centric, and that really help to make EMM survey data fair. 
And so to give you a concrete example, we recently launched what is called the EMM Survey Registry. And this tool is intended to serve as a single access point to information or metadata about existing surveys, especially those that have been undertaken in Europe. And since we're here today to discuss EOSC, I wanted to also share kind of two positive outputs that have come from this open science or open research-based research, uh, agenda, which both improve how EMM data is accessed and reused through the use of machines. So first, going back to our EMM survey registry example, we've set it up so that our metadata can be harvested by machines, namely other social sciences data archives, because we offer the metadata in a machine-readable format in our case, we're providing the metadata in XML format that complies with DDI Codebook, which is a data documentation standard that's widely used and accepted within the social sciences survey research community. Now, the second example actually comes from our colleagues from IMISCO, which stands for International Migration, Integration, and Social Cohesion in Europe. And this is an interdisciplinary research network in Europe for migration studies. And what they have done is also launch their own new tool called the Migration Research Hubs Research Database. And what this tool essentially does is it offers a real-time census of existing migration-related publications. And they're able to do this because they're using APIs, which have been backed by kind of formal agreements that allow them to collect and harvest information about, about publications from parties like Web of Science Group and Cross Reference, which are very publication-oriented entities. So to wrap things up, um, we as a data community are really excited to see how we can further tap into research opportunities made possible through EOS, especially those that include the use of machines, machine learning, and AI. So thanks, Ron. Thank you, Ami. Um, the next speaker is uh, Kees van der Eyck on election studies. Uh, Kees is professor of social science research methods at the University of uh, Nottingham. He has a very long CV, but he admitted that if I shorten it, it gets better. So I will conclude with that he has authored over 20 academic books, more than 100 articles on methodology, research methods, electoral studies, and politics. Uh, Case, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ron. Uh, when we talk about the user community of election studies, it's already in the name what this user community is about. Uh, they're studying elections, uh, producing data, they're using data, publishing about that, etc. And election studies are commonplace, uh, basically in all democratic societies, particularly those that are rich enough to afford the investment in such studies, but increasingly also in the rest of the world where regular elections are being conducted. So the election studies community is worldwide. Uh, it has a very strong uh, subsection, if you want to call it that way, in Europe, but of course also, uh, and historically uh, it started there in the United States um, and in, in many other countries. Um, when we look at this community, uh, we can say that in a number of ways it is highly interconnected. Uh, and then I think about matters like theory, conceptual frameworks, data and methods. People know each other, people know what they do in other parts of the world, what kind of theories they are uh, developing, what kind of data they use, how they develop methods and so on. So in that respect, it's a highly interconnected and also highly developed user community. Yet in a number of other ways, it is weakly organized. Um, the main organizational structures, if there are any at all, are at the national level not at a, a supranational level, and they're focused almost exclusively on data collection, not on data integration, not on data analysis uh, or, or things like that. Um, and therefore we find uh, particularly around what's called national election studies, which are uh, the, these uh, data collection uh, enterprises that are predominant uh, in, in very many countries, uh, we find that every time again, uh, they are being conducted, they're being conducted well, but there are few, relatively few connections uh, between them. These data that are being uh, produced are generally fair compliant. They're well documented, uh, they are uh, well described with metadata, 
and that is mainly the work and the contribution uh, from data archives who have imposed, if you want it that way, but we're grateful for that, uh, a set of standards uh, for uh, making data fair compliant. And in that respect, they are. Uh, and the degree of actual shared use and of uh, contributing uh, added value in further cycles of, of these data uh, of their life is, uh, is very high. But beyond that, uh, there is little infrastructure or development of infrastructure. And we'll talk later about a, a number of consequences that that has. Next slide, please. And so what kind of data uh, are being used and produced in this user community? Well, a lot of things, but the, I think uh, at least 80 to 90% of it uh, comes down to three kinds of things. Uh, large N voter surveys. Um, those are generally referred to as national election studies and similar kind of uh, enterprises. Party manifestos uh, that uh, have been drafted by parties uh, to set out their stall, if you want it that way, uh, before an election, and those have been coded. Uh, and of course, the uh, uh, outcomes of elections in terms of election results, uh, not only for uh, uh, systems as a whole or countries as a whole, but also for all kinds of geographical subunits going sometimes down to uh, election uh, wards. Um, and all these data are comparable in principle over time for different elections within a particular country, for instance, and over countries. Uh, so that's basically the situation where we find ourselves in, in some ways, uh, an embarrassment of riches, uh, but that provides also its own problems. Thank you. Thank you, Kees. Um... From elections, we move to heritage uh, science with uh, Emiliano Degli Innocenti. Emiliano is a researcher at CNR and the national coordinator of Daria Italy and the DigiLab uh, platform. Emiliano, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ron. So I will be briefly presenting what heritage science and the community around it uh, is. Uh, first of all, we can say that uh, heritage science is an emerging uh, uh, discipline uh, that is uh, gathering together very different uh, uh, professionals and researchers uh, encomp encompassing many different uh, research fields uh, ranging from uh, uh, chemistry, physical studies, uh, um, to the humanities, archaeology, philology, art historians, uh, historians, and, uh, uh, and what have you. So this is uh, a multidisciplinary research field at its core. Uh, the IRIS, which is the European Research Infrastructure for Heritage Science, is uh, a distributed research infrastructure, meaning that it has uh, a lot of different national nodes that are keeping together national communities and is built to shape uh, a strong identity for this community that is currently still fragmented into uh, different uh, sub communities uh, dealing with very specific uh, kind of uh, studies and uh, analysis. Uh, and Iris will be trying to uh, uh, bring this uh, to a more uh, um, interoperable uh, level, supporting the interpretation, the preservation, the documentation, and of course, the management of both tangible and intangible aspects of our cultural and natural uh, uh, heritage. So basically, our community is uh, both producing and consuming huge volumes of very uh, uh, different kinds of scientific data, uh, ranging from uh, uh, measurement results coming from the various facilities, the labs that are uh, um, uh, working with IRIS, uh, that are very large facilities, uh, that are mobile laboratories, or even digital tools and, uh, uh, and other instruments. So, uh, uh, first uh, is keeping together all those uh, very diverse uh, kind of data. And uh, uh, for doing this, we are planning to 
build a digital infrastructure to keep together. Next, uh, next slide, please. The existing uh, four uh, facilities that you can see it are our club, which is basically a traditional fixed uh, kind of uh, facility, which uh, uh, is giving access to very special kind of documents that are preserved in uh, um, uh, organized scientific uh, um, uh, infrastructures, uh, mainly archives uh, like the Opificio delle Pietre Dure or others around Europe. The Fix Lab, which is about fixed facilities, very big, large scale, like uh, um, accelerators, uh, neutron sources, uh, that are used to do analysis and diagnosis over cultural heritage artifacts. Then MOLAB, which is pretty the same. So doing diagnostical analysis over cultural artifacts, but with mobile laboratories and instruments. And then the fourth one, which is the DigiLab uh, virtual facility that is meant to provide a common layer of comparability, interoperability of fairness to all of this uh, kind of data. Next slide, please. So which is the, 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 the most important kind of impact that IRIS has uh, right now? Uh, for us, in, uh, access is the first, very first key of success. And out of, of this uh, access, you can see in the right column of this slide that the digital kind of access represents more than a half of the overall impact leaving to the transnational traditional uh, kind of uh, impact a large but uh, uh, still not as relevant as the digital uh, um, kind of uh, importance. So uh, this is the most uh, uh, relevant kind of impact we can expect. We have also a secondary non-measurable non uh, kind of impacts that are, uh, you can read the science diplomacy. So uh, providing to the decisors, to the politics, uh, what they need in order to elaborate uh, coherent and effective policies for cultural heritage preservation and stuff and impact, um, fostering impact on access to culture and cultural uh, tourism. This is more or less the situation right now. And this is my last uh, slide and thank you. Thank you, Emiliano. Then we move to Alberto Meloni. Um, he's a professor of history of Christianity at the University of uh, Modena and also the chairholder of the UNESCO Chair of Religious Pluralism and Peace at the University of Bologna. And I think I can also mention that uh, recently he has been appointed in the group of uh, seven uh, chief scientific advisors of the European Commission. Congrats on that. Uh, Alberto, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ron. Uh, my task here is to uh, introduce to you to the work of uh, resilience uh, when we invented this acronym of religious studies, uh, uh, libraries, uh, centers, networks, and experts. Uh, the word resilience was not so uh, common as it is uh, today in the post pandemic world, uh, but uh, the, the purpose was to offer a name explaining why scholars who worked in the field crossed by or crossing uh, the, the region's experience can be gathered into a larger community. Uh, the, the, the research uh, community uh, in the field of religious uh, studies uh, is uh, now on the process of launching European research infrastructure under the S3 uh, uh, label and uh, it has been recognized as a potential strategic area by the last S3 roadmap. It is a community of people coming from humanities, uh, so philologists and philosophers, uh, scholars working in historical terms of sociology, psychology of religion, history of art, so a variety of uh, 
topics and uh, specialties uh, linked by one point. Uh, religious studies is uh, an area in which uh, uh, long-term research is uh, very important and uh, if long-term research and if uh, the complexity of the community is taken as such, this is a point of strength. If not, it is a point of fragmentation. And so for us, uh, virtual access and open science means uh, an important challenge, not simply to make uh, easier and uh, to reduce the time of uh, research, but also to make possible the raising of questions coming from this long-term experience. Go to the next slide. Uh, because if uh, one have to explain, as it happens to me, uh, why religious studies is different from uh, the main field of history or uh, cultural heritage and so on, my answer is that religious studies uh, is an area in which there is a fight on the past. Uh, what is vulgarly called radicalization, namely the uh, pandemic of violent extremism among religious community and non-religious community. Uh, one may say that this comes from uh, an ambiguity concerning the past, an attempt to reduce the past to a shorter era. And so for us, uh, the ability and the capacity to address uh, uh, global topics in all the chronicle terms uh, is a way to improve research to and to make visible the role of open science for uh, the decision uh, makers. Uh, for us, this means, of course, to offer uh, translational access uh, in a more uh, precise and easy way, uh, to a less expensive way for scholars uh, to open the possibility to work on uh, uh, our labs that are the libraries, even from very remote areas and creating uh, ties of diplomatic uh, uh, relation with uh, other country and uh, areas. But it mostly means uh, uh, the possibility to uh, let the sources raise new questions. Uh, we are on, on the clivage uh, between uh, the digital innovation and the AI innovation. And open science for us is a very uh, needed instrument uh, to push this uh, uh, transformation, this uh, uh, change from uh, uh, digital to AI uh, instrument. Digital terms in religious studies uh, means uh, uh, digitization of data and uh, workflows uh, going into the domain of big data and artificial intelligence means a way to understand the longer term resources and all of their richness in a very uh, complicated way, offering new questions for uh, uh, artificial intelligence, new questions for human intelligent uh, good uh, answers and vice versa. And so this uh, as uh, uh, for the European Union and uh, for uh, many other countries as a real social impact that is very visible and uh, measurable. Uh, we live in a society in which uh, uh, religious literacy is growing uh, because uh, uh, what has been for uh, many decades a standard process of people growing into a religious uh, uh, culture and uh, being emancipated by their own choices or different choices is uh, leaving room for a more widespread religious alphabetism and this is matching a religious climate change. The religious temperature is growing like the temperature of the planet and so to uh, uh, manage this type of change it needs not only uh, goodwill and uh, valeur republicaine but it needs also knowledge and uh, scientific research and uh, for us uh, the building of uh, a larger a research infrastructure of religious studies and the community of religious studies uh, scholars is a way to respond to this uh, and to have an impact, uh, a positive impact and a fertile role in the shaping of uh, Europe in the next decades. Thank you. Thank you, Alberto. Then we move on to Jennifer, Jennifer Edmund. Uh, she's a professor of digital humanities at Trinity College in, in Dublin, uh, where she's also the co-director of, of the Trinity Center for Digital Humanities. And she also serves as uh, president of the board of directors of uh, DARIA. 
Jennifer. Thank you very much, Ron. Um, it's a bit strange for me to be in this company today and not be wearing my Daria hat, but actually I was asked to be on this panel as a representative of the Shape ID project, which is a project looking at interdisciplinary research and particularly as it engages the arts and humanities. And I think the reason they asked me, other than the fact that they, they are across the hall from me when I'm in my hallway, is that my area of research as a citizen scholar, as it were, is the digital humanities. And in case you don't know the digital humanities, I would assume many or most of you do, um, it is an area of, of really methodological innovation that brings together computer science, information science as delivered through museums, libraries and archives, and also the many, many disciplines of the arts and humanities. So again, a very big space. If you'd go to the next slide, please. So the way this works and the way I think it's, it's, it's easiest to understand the, uh, the, the work that is done, but also the impact that it has and the way in which machines are used is to think about these, these various contributors and think about even though my arrow is only point inward, the actually the innovation and the influence goes both inward and outward. So starting at the top, the way we engage with uh, computer science and software development is, is really through the tools we use. Um, there's a strong application of natural language processing, of data analysis, of visualization techniques, but of course, always in the, the service of a, of a different kind of work. So currently there's, there's all sorts of tools that I'm trying to get my master's students to engage with. And it's a very big transformation coming from a traditional humanities background. Um, but the way in which that actually plays very interestingly is then you have that very analog, very theoretical, uh, very source, source specific set of approaches coming from the arts and humanities and also feeding in to this different set of approaches. But I think it's important not to forget uh, the, 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 the contributions of the museums, libraries and archives and, as well. And this becomes very important when we start to talk about the EOSC, I think in the, in the next set of, of questions because we don't create our data. I can't recreate, you know, the 19th century in Germany, which is, you know, the area of literature that I'm, I'm trained to, as a scholar in. Um, I have to take what they left. And what they left is also in the hands of the museums, the libraries, and the archives. So that uh, sharing of the data is something that we have learned a lot from and something that we hold very dear. But I suppose from the Shape ID perspective, one of the most important things to remember is that bit in the middle. Um, because when you're trying to bring together data science, computer science, and the arts and humanities, you have to develop as a, a, a metadiscipline or as a methodological community, some very, very strong metadisciplinary competencies. Um, and so one of the things I have learned as, as someone whose scholarship really does sit in that middle area um, is the importance of early negotiations around terminology, data, success, knowledge creation. All of these things actually are quite negotiable uh, between epistemic communities, and that's very important. And that also becomes very important when we're applying uh, these, these technological tools and processes, the concept of data, to areas in which that is, is really very much uh, critiqued and queried. Um, so that, I think, gives you a sense of the, the landscape we operate in as an interdisciplinary community and the way in which we are using technological tools now, and we can move into how that might uh, evolve in the future. Thank you. Uh, thank you all. Um, <clears throat> if, if I may try to, to, to summarize a little bit, uh, what I hear in, in all these presentations is uh, the, the, the cross-domain aspect, so, some even by, by design. Uh, there is also the struggle with uh, how, how to make full use of the digitization that, uh, that is now available. And, and you, I think you all face uh, either fragmentation on, on, on the data or of, of the disciplinary field um, and looking for solutions, looking for solutions. How can machines or AI help you? Uh, and I think many of you also deal with sensitive data. Uh, and and that, that is also an issue that, that, that should be resolved. Um, and before we go to 10 years from now, where you have all the solutions uh, for these problems, uh, I give the floor to, to Marike uh, uh, to, to run the, the Slido at the, at the conference. Yes, Marike. Thanks, Ron. Thanks. Um, so I would like everyone to, to invite everyone to slido.com, uh, where you then enter the hashtag EOSC10. Um, so 
slido.com and then hashtag EOSC10 so that we can ask you a few questions. So the first question is, are you making use of machines, tools, software for your research? So you can simply answer by yes or no. Um, see, already a few people have found the slido.com and then hashtag EOSC10. So that's quite unanimous here, Ron, uh, the answer to this yeah, question. Wrong question. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> but it's just to get uh, started, to warming up. Yeah, but this won't lead to discussions. <laughs> no. So let's go to the next one. Imagine your research in 10 years time. So that's where we're going to go with the, with the panel as well. Will you be performing interdisciplinary research? Uh, so some of you already do. Uh, then yes, no, or, or maybe. Some people may not know yet. So that's also quite, uh, quite positive here. Uh, well, at least my conclusion that, uh, that all of the speakers do the cross-disciplinary is, uh, is, is uh, confirmed. Yeah. Yeah. OK, so going to the next question. Do you use data catalogs to find your data? So this is an open question where you can, uh, where you can. Yes or no, or own. name name the catalog. Exactly. Yeah. Occasionally. Some of the many. Okay. Google data. Ah, there is search. Google. I was I was counting and <laughs> waiting for Google. I use my Google through data.gov, EGI, CEDA, B2Find. Yes, but only in the most generic sense. No, in general, only otherwise known data sources. Currently, no, because I collect the data. Google, Clarence Virtual Language Observatory. Google, Ziva Hub, Europeana. OK. So let's move to the next question here. Do you use multiple catalogs? I think uh, some of you already answered that in the, in the previous question. So either yes or how many or no. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Lots, okay. Maybe some of you can give a number, an estimate. Yes, says that, then GCS, Eurostat, OECD. Yes, many repository, library catalogs, archives. Yes, five, five to 10. Not really Google provides. Oh, I didn't see that one. Google provides everything I need. Yes, national and joint says that. Okay, let's get, move to the last one, how do you keep track of relevant data? For example, external tools and writing URL or bookmarking in your browser. So how do you keep track of them? How do you do that? Bookmarking and paper. Downloading local storage, collect links, Zotero, DOIs for data, URLs, reference to paper. Currently trying Zotero for that purpose. External tools, bookmarking usually, bookmarking and emails to coworkers, <laughs> current virtual collection yeah, registry. Put it in the email, <laughs> then, then, then you <laughs> can find it again. Copying into external tools and feeding my own specific data bases. Mostly bookmarking. Collecting links, Google Docs, bookmarks, refworks. Okay, there's a wide variety here. Okay. Okay, I think this is the last question, by the way. So, if there was an app that allowed you to make a virtual collection of your favorite data, would you be interested? Well, that's a very quick yes. Also, some a few no's, but mainly yes. Okay, so 90% says yes. Um, 
so I think it's it's time to go back to the to the discussion run. I'll I'll put the the slides back on. Uh, thank you, Marike. Thank you for the audience for for responding. Um, on if I may add, there's uh, one more general question in the uh, question part. Yes, um, I'm, I see uh, this one and uh, let, let, let's include it in the, in the discussion. What yeah. I want to do now is uh, ask each of the panelists uh, to, to uh, say 10 years from now, how you are working, what is the role of machines, uh, and also what can EOS do for you in 10 years, but also perhaps already now. And I think all panelists uh, can see the, the question by uh, Anka Hinola. Um, so I give the floor the same, let's keep the same sequence. So we start with the Slava. Thanks, Ron. So obviously, CoronaVI is built uh, around of artificial intelligence, and basically, we are trying to build machine learning models and help human experts to find some new insights in scientific literature and uh, deliver new data sets on research topics. So uh, you see, there is a lot of development uh, last years, and NLP, for example, pipelines and tools, they are really progressing. And uh, there is famous development, uh, new algorithm called GPT-3. For example, created by OpenAI um, uh, startup that was founded by Elon Musk, and it looks fancy and uh, it, it seems to work, uh, so it can answer some questions. But if you uh, dive into details, it makes no sense without actually context uh, what is uh, given to you. So, in the same time, in Europe, I think we will have more sustainable uh, approach and. Uh, like in EOSC, uh, it's more fundamental and conceptual uh, approach to build knowledge graphs, for example. So we can definitely contribute to this kind of global developments and uh, we can improve uh, their tools and we, we can work together with people producing artificial intelligence algorithms. And uh, we can add also possibility uh, to, curate and, uh, to curate data and to keep provenance of data. And we can do a lot of interesting things for them. And I would say in 10 years time, uh, it's also very important to uh, align all standards because uh, we have a lot of problems with uh, like ontologies that uh, people are using for different communities. Now it's not interlinked. And uh, also we have open proprietary ontologies. Uh, for example, uh, mesh ontology is used for COVID-19, but it's owned by National Library of uh, United States. So uh, we want to make it more open and more usable by people, by searchers. So uh, proper knowledge graph is also a very important topic. And I think EOS sh sh should do more about that. Can I, can I ask on the knowledge graph, is, is that currently manual work? You, you have to put in all the relationships? Uh, yeah, so currently it's manual work, but uh, the way how we are trying to solve this problem, uh, we are basically creating machine models um, to train, um, we are using this data to train machine, mod, uh, machine models, and the idea that artificial intelligence can do exactly the same work. So okay, this thank is you. Idea, and uh, this is very long way to go, I would say, because uh, mm -hmm. different ontologies, and uh, also we have a lot of problems with provenance, and uh, we don't understand from where data is coming, and uh, you know, fake news, and these kind of challenges is not possible to solve uh, quickly and uh, well. It's a long way, like, like I already yes. said. Okay, then, then we switch to Ami. Perhaps she, she has the solution, uh, Ami, in 10 years from now. That's a really interesting question. And um, to be very honest, our data community hasn't been able to discuss too much um, what we want to achieve in 10 years time because we're really focused on what we can do right now. Um, but I was able to connect with quite a few members of our data community and we've collectively kind of thought of a response to this question. So since we are a data community with a f where our primary focus is about making EMM survey data fair, we want in 10 years time, in very crude terms, to see the adoption of the fair principles for all EMM survey data, at least those that are being produced from now and onward. Um, but we recognize that this is certainly a very ambitious goal and there's a lot of work to be done uh, by all the various stakeholders of EMM survey data to achieve this. So what we've also done is come up with an idea of what role we can play as a data community to help make all this EMM survey data fair, 
particularly in terms of how we further develop and enhance the EMM survey registry through the use of machine learning. Um, before I share our idea, though, I do want to stress that our data community may not necessarily have the strongest of representation of individuals who are experts in machine learning. And personally, I have more or less a basic understanding. Um, so our idea may be a bit difficult or complex to execute through the use of machine learning. Um, in other words, what we propose may be a bit more on the creative side, especially when contrasted with what Slava has just shared about Corona Y and the work that he does. Um, but anyways, um, our idea is essentially to find some way to autonomously search for EMM survey related uh, areas of the web, like research project websites, but also public records of mailing lists or groups for research, where oftentimes research use it as a platform to share their work with one another. And this would then allow us to find EMM surveys that could be documented in the EMM survey registry that we haven't been able to find ourselves um, through our own searches. And I guess what we're envisioning here, in essence, is a very sophisticated web scraping so we can find the survey name, the producers of the survey, including their contact details. And then once we collect this information, we could then have the machine send an automatic message to the data producer explaining what our registry is and asking if they would like to contribute metadata about their survey to the registry. Mm. So if, 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 if I may, yeah. Also, there, there is a question uh, in, in, in the Q&A on, on, on sensitive data. Uh, so my, yes, do, do you deal with sensitive data? Um, and perhaps do, do you have already tools for this or, or do you have a user bases where you can uh, log in? Do you already have solutions for that? So within, I guess, uh, the, the work that we're doing for Shock, we're actually not directly working with the original data, which is where the sensitive information will be found. We're mainly working with data about the data. So um, we don't necessarily have tools in place ourselves that allow us to better work with sensitive data, but our aim is to, uh, we recognize that uh, for many researchers and anyone who would be interested in the type of data that we work with, they are working um, with sensitive data. So when we talk about the FAIR principles, we have to keep that in mind and be reasonable about when they can be applied with the type of data that we're working with. Okay, and another question is about mm -hmm. sharing data. You, you say, I want to know who, who has all these types of data. Are researchers currently reluctant to, to, to share the data? Um, I wouldn't say that's necessarily the, the common kind of uh, reaction. Um, there are certainly instances, and these are more one-off cases, where we've encountered maybe research teams or researchers who are a bit more hesitant about making their data fully accessible because they're working on very sensitive topics and they are perhaps cautious about having their data misused by, by someone because that's kind of the risk you take when you make your data accessible. But I would say the more common reason why maybe data is not so easy to find or hidden is because in different countries, the, the data creation practices and tools are developed at different stages. So for example, in countries like GISIS in France, we do have you know, official national data archives that are able to help researchers deposit their data, make sure that they're doing this in a, an ethical manner. Um, but that's not always the case in the different countries. So I think for us, we've learned through, through our data community and trying to develop the EMM survey registry that we also have to keep in mind that there are differences in how researchers are experiencing experiencing open science and this push to make data fair. And, and we has a, have a responsibility as a collective group to support individuals who might not have the same type of tools and resources available to them yet. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ami. Uh, we move to Case. Yeah, if, if I may hark back on what I just said uh, in, in, in my first contribution, to some extent we experience a embarrassment of riches, uh, which means that we have so many resources, so many sources of data, different kinds of data from different periods, different countries, and, and so on, uh, that making use of all of that in an integrated fashion becomes a problem. And while each of these data sources is well documented, uh, well described by metadata, etc., the way in which that is done is not necessarily the same across resources. Uh, so even if I go to a particular country, like I'm living now in the UK, and I look at national election studies in Britain, which are called the British election study, as you can imagine, uh, then we see that over time, the way in which they are coded uh, and the way in which they are described is not the same. Each one 
is done very well, but collectively uh, it doesn't fit together. Uh, this even gets worse when we go compare across countries uh, or when we go compare across different kinds of uh, data. Uh, so, for instance, uh, party manifestos on the one hand, uh, voter service on the other hand, media content, uh, and, and so on. So one of the big problems that we have, uh, and that I hope that uh, advances in AI uh, may help us with, uh, is harmonization of data so that uh, we are better able uh, to use multiple data sources at the same time rather than to focus on only a single one um, and to link or connect if you want to call it that way uh, data from different kinds uh, sometimes this is relatively simple but sometimes it's it's quite complex how do we combine uh, media content information with voter surveys uh, to analyze it uh, as one uh, collective uh, bit of information. Um, so that are two of the big challenges, I think, that we uh, uh, have to address harmonization and linking of data. And finally, managing this explosion of uh, publication data sets and what have you. And uh, so within shock, the development uh, and the attempt to develop a knowledge graph in electoral studies uh, is one uh, effort uh, that is aimed uh, to, to master to some extent uh, this explosion of material, uh, both in terms of publications and data sets in a way that makes it more manageable uh, for researchers to find their way in that. Okay, thank you. Uh, perhaps you should hire someone from CERN or I ESA that uh, that take all these uh, collision data in. And uh, why see, not? See how they structure. <laughs> okay, be be before we go to yeah, we 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 bridge to physics by uh, going to Emiliano. He uh, as as heritage science is uh, multidisciplinary by by design. So Emiliano, in ten years from now, where are you? So uh, first of all, I would like to uh, recall what are the major obstacles for uh, uh, unleash, uh, unleashing the full potential of our research today. We said that, uh, uh, Jennifer said that uh, we are studying uh, what's left of our past, and this is really true. The problem is that what's left uh, as, uh, is to be considered on the analog side, so we have uh, uh, manuscripts, uh, documents, uh, uh, other witnesses of our past that are preserved somewhere in libraries, archives, museums, con collections of different kinds, and that are still to be uh, digitized and many times still to be described, even in, a, uh, in, a, in, a, in an analog uh, form. And this is uh, one of the problems that we are facing. Uh, uh, we still lack some of the documents we need, both in uh, digital uh, form, and we still have some of our cultural heritage buried within archives, libraries, and other uh, institutions, memory institutions, uh, that are really hidden. So this is the first problem. Then we have, a, this is a problem of fragmentation, both on the digital and on the analog side of the things. Then on the digital side of the things, we have lots of digital resources that are uh, really uh, tricky to be handled in a coherent and in an effective way, because you have to know um, many websites, uh, you have to be uh, uh, expert of the way that uh, they are using to expose their data, that uh, you have to know how they are managing the data, so it's a little bit tricky. Then you have a lot of catalogs, and you still have to cope with the very different workflows into the digital uh, uh, realm that produced all those digital resources and that you have to know in order to effectively reuse uh, those digital resources. And those are the major obstacles in 10 years. So I have some keywords, interaction. Interaction between people, 
and between different instruments. I have my experience in Iris. We have three different platforms. We need to make those platforms interact in the terms that if they are going, the, the, the researchers, they are going to produce valuable data sets out of the, uh, those labs, those platforms, the data sets that they are producing should be comparable. I mean, should be reusable in different environments. Rather, you cannot expect to use the data set only in the vertical domain that produced the data sets. So, and, and this is true for domains, this is true for uh, techniques, this is true for uh, tools. And this is the first uh, point. So interaction between people and instruments. Then we have a problem of, of identification of resources, both in the digital uh, uh, domain, because we uh, are keep talking about persistent identificators. Uh, we are talking about uh, unique identificators. So identification is a key because we have many different descriptions produced by many different contexts that are mostly related to uh, very uh, similar, if not uh, the same uh, uh, items. And this is something that we should be able to cope with. Then we have the integration. Once we have all of those different descriptions that are produced by different uh, specialists around the same objects, we should be able to integrate the different kind of knowledge that we have at our disposal into a unified uh, data space that is composed by syntactical, uh, I mean, standards, uh, uh, semantic uh, uh, problems uh, to be aligned. Um, so ontologies, uh, thesauri, and what have you. Then there is the problem of interpretation uh, so you have, once you have this rich uh, data landscape, you still have to figure out how to extract and to interpret the knowledge, both the explicit knowledge, so the knowledge that is hard coded into the data, and uh, to extract uh, new hidden knowledge that is to be found with AI, with NLP, with other advanced techniques, in those uh, uh, data landscape. And this has to, of course, uh, to do with the, the, our ability to, uh, to, to uh, elaborate, design, and implement the right tools for the, uh, for the right uh, targets and objectives. And of course, uh, this is, uh, uh, Alberto Melloni talked about the global warming, which is one of the risk uh, that uh, he is facing in his field of research. But uh, in heritage science, and I think uh, not only in heritage science, but in other domains, we are facing another risk, which is the digital resources uh, risk of fade, fading away of uh, what we are producing now, because we don't still know in 10 years, in 15 years, uh, Jennifer uh, was referring to what's left uh, um, of our history. My problem here is what we are going to produce and what we are going to leave to who is uh, uh, making science or making history uh, in 15, in 30 years uh, from now. And this is more or less the kind of landscape that I have in mind. Okay, t t thank you, Emiliano. That also make the connection to Alberto and, and, and Jennifer, but uh, first to Alberto, please. Yes, well, uh, it's hard to say what will happen in 10 years. Uh, you know, when I started to work uh, here at the Foundation for Religious Studies, I started with the concordance of uh, texts and uh, I was sent to meet Father Booms, the one who started to make the Index Domesticus uh, with uh, Mr. Watson himself, not the Watson computer, but Mr. Watson himself, uh, working with the concordance of St. Thomas. And so uh, he started with cards, he continued with tapes, he continued again uh, with the CD, and did everything was in a USB. 
but the problems that he was underlining, he died when he was 100 years old. Uh, the problem that he underlined is that in the waving of the tools, the questions remained unsolved and open. And so I'm wondering what will happen when in 10 years we will look at the ESA scale supercomputing, like in the way we now look to a Commodore computer that I'm old enough to have used for the first time I was writing with uh, something different from a type uh, machine. And so for me, uh, the problem is that uh, what I hope that is the capacity to meet, uh, to managing data will offer to us a, possible, a possibility to change hermeneutics and approaches. Uh, what is specific in our field, it is the fact, the difference between Emiliano and me is that Emiliano is working of an heritage once that the heritage is constituted as, as a such. And this knowledge is something that is, so to say, dead. Heritage means uh, this. What we are living and working with is a living past. A past living in people that is thinking that beheading a professor in Conflans is a way to honor the prophet. And uh, thinking that to build up uh, the, the Lord uh, military army in uh, Western Africa is a way of interpreting the past. And so for us, the idea of big data and AI in the future is a possibility to uh, offer a, a capacity to understand scientifically the past, uh, questioning the misuse and the abuse and the violent use of this past that is very, uh, very common. Now, now with the, I'm very glad to the, 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 the COVID-Y uh, platform. Uh, now, with the, we know very well and we understand very well even the uh, people that is very far from medicine research, uh, the, the importance of open science for uh, the COVID pandemic and of the crisis. What will save life is not science, is open science. Because simply with the old science, we would have expected probably 10 years to have vaccine, to have, uh, I think, and when I, when I listen to people saying that science is saving our lives from COVID, I say, this is true, it's open science. And uh, when the idea of open science was launched by Commissioner Moedas, everybody was very skeptical that uh, scientists would be uh, glad and happy to share data that everywhere in every discipline they are um, probably very jealous of. And uh, what I expect from my field is that uh, uh, the, the breakout of the importance of open science will come out from the possibility to capture billions of uh, data and offering a way of walking through this uh, uh, wide uh, amount of uh, things in a new way, having the possibility to check wrong answer and to check good answers uh, in uh, a time that is compatible with the life expectations. Okay, thank you. Um, there is another question coming in about the role of training, but perhaps before that, we, we finalize this round with uh, Jennifer. Sure, thanks, Ron. Um, this is a very difficult panel to come at the end of because I think most of the, the most important points have been made. Um, in particular, I think Emiliano's experience would be very similar to mine. You know, Alberto had the great anecdote. What am I left with? I'm a literature <laughs> professor by training. So what I'm left with is a metaphor. So let me, let me explain it to you this way. Current work in the digital humanities sometimes feels like having one of those research assistants who's young, brilliant, a little bit arrogant, and kind of goes out, doesn't always necessarily understand what I want, sort of bring something back that maybe is not what says they can't find or that what I'm looking for doesn't exist or you know, tries to dictate how I do things, okay? Now, what does that young research assistant grow into? Do they grow into the very arrogant? <laughs> you know, when we go to scale, when we have the EOSC, when we start using AI, does that mean that this, this research assistant will be hiding things from me, that I won't be able to see what they're doing, that what how they're trying to integrate with my methods is not gonna be transparent, 
Or do they turn into that brilliant postdoc who actually just almost like reads my mind and brings me what I need and shows me things that are interesting. And I actually answered no to the question about the app to bring all my data together because every instance in the digital humanities where I've seen this kind of attempt to create these, these, um, these all workflow solutions, they've failed because there's always something in that workflow that is sensitive to the exact tools that are being used. And when you take the whole workflow and try and replace it, you can get into a lot of trouble. So when I think about, well, where do I want the EOSC to put my work in 10 years? First of all, I need access to data. And for that, the EOSC needs to integrate cultural heritage data as scientific data, as research data across the board. I need it to be available for text and data, man text and data mining. And that means I need stuff that's more recent than the 19th century. So I really want actually that wide level copyright social innovation to happen so that the EOS can really sing for my research. Um, and I also need to find ways of having the non-digital incorporated. Yes, I'm suggesting we need to have non-digital stuff in the digital research infrastructure. And I mean, again, colleagues have already said it, that's where the stuff is. So you need to, to be able to facilitate my research to be where the stuff is. Don't be that, don't be the arrogant old postdoc, be the great postdoc who gives me what I need. Number two, I need access to tools and I need to know what those tools mean, what they can do from my workflows for that. And this is something I think the shock marketplace development is really doing very well is looking at, well, okay, so for these tools, how have they been used? What are their biases that they've baked in? What can, um, what can they do? What can they not do? What are their constraints? How have they been used? How are they documented? The community aspect of these tools is super important. So we need to make sure that whatever large scale work we have, that it incorporates that level of, of context. I think Slava said it at the beginning, context is all important. How do we make sure that we have that for the tools that we're, we're using? And then finally, getting back to that bit in the center, the bit of digital humanities that really interests me is that interdisciplinarity. Um, we forget how much we put our fingerprints onto the data that we, we create, the data that we manage, the data that we adapt, and of course the tools that we have to do that. So really what we need is something that gives that layer of context that helps me do what we, I don't know how many of you know the Trinity College Dublin campus, but we have a great, great big cricket pitch in the middle of it. And the arts and humanities is on one side and computer science and the sciences are on the other. We talk about crossing the cricket pitch. What I really want is the EOS to be able to help me cross the cricket pitch to know when I'm using somebody else's tool, when I'm using somebody else's data, um, know what I'm dealing with, know what they've baked into it. And again, I always go back to what Commissioner Moidash said about um, the, the EOSC as being a new republic of letters. For that, we really need those translational languages, those kind of interlanguages and boundary languages that can help us do that. And the one thing I would say is that these three things that I really want to see in the digital humanities of the future, they're not really technical. They're at that social technical or technocultural divide where we really need to invest in the communities and not just in the infrastructure. So that would be the things that I would love to see happen in the next 10 years for my field. Uh, thank you, Jennifer. Um, <clears throat> on, on, on the training aspect, mm. uh, there is this question by, by Linda Martin um, uh, to, to train the students and the researchers. Um, any ideas on how we should tackle this, how we should incorporate the training? Perhaps, it's, Jennifer, you start now instead yeah. of... I, I, think, I think it's an incredibly important thing. Um, and it's actually one of the areas in the EOS ecosystem that in the Daria side, we're most um, investing in just because we recognize how important it is. There's a tendency to view uh, only the tip of the iceberg when it comes to training. So, you know, we have any, you know, you have a platform, you need to teach people to use the platform. But actually, there's that whole set. Again, there's another cricket pitch there. There's that set of skills that people need, whether they are basic research data management, whether it is, again, in the, the context of my community, whether it is really recognizing what elements of your workflow actually are data driven, recognizing the word data and what it means in a humanities context. You can get more and more fundamental, but if we really are going to reach that high level of integration that we aspire to, and those, you know, those great, you know, that great paradigmatic work that we see where somebody really did manage to bring things together and come up with something very fresh and very new, 
we will need to start quite fundamentally, um, both in terms of early on in people's education process, but also quite fundamentally in terms of what does it mean to work in an interdisciplinary context? What do we need to negotiate? How do we do that? How do we expose our own biases? How do we recognize our own biases? From there, all the way up to how to use a specific tool, how to manage data, how to, to negotiate data. Um, I think that there is a lot of work to do there. I think it's a really, really important uh, thing to bring up, Linda. Yeah, continuing on, on, on this aspect, um, we, we, we talked about the data, the integration of uh, the, the help of machines, etc. You talked about the, the, the training. In 10 years from now, um, I wonder, would there be a further unbundling of activities within science? In other words, will there be a specialization in science that you have data scientists, uh, machine scientists, whatever scientists, what, what, what is your view on this uh, development? Will there be further specialization? Um, I think that there's a question, is it further specialization or is it further despecialization? So I, I, one of the things we talk about in the digital humanities is the idea of the post-digital humanities. So the idea that the time will come that the digital methods will become so ingrained in what we do that we won't actually separate it off as something else anymore. And that's where I think we actually need to move across the disciplines, I would assume. Again, I only know my own very well, but that we need to have this, this layer, uh, not necessarily of new specialties, but of actually the sublimation of the specialties in. However, you're always gonna need certain people with the expertise at the methodological side to make sure that that continues to work and that the disciplinary work can, can still continue. So I think rather than creating whole new disciplines, I think we need instigators and facilitators, people who are broad rather than narrow within the disciplines who can actually make that happen. Alberto, you have an opinion on this? I think that uh, the problem from a point of view of uh, specialization is uh, the possibility to open interactions among different uh, disciplines and uh, fields. Uh, we are now, for, for example, working on a medieval topic, and namely uh, the, the beginning of the theory of interest in different sources, Jewish, Christian, and uh, Islamic. Uh, regulations uh, in uh, all the three areas it is the theoretical forbidden and for us it would be very important to offer the possibility to uh, overcome the specialization that is needed for each of this field in a common uh, uh, framework in a broader area and uh, this uh, that usually has been done in the past uh, through instruments that we all know that, that the congress and the journals and so on could be also made possible through possibility of access uh, uh, to uh, specialized resources that could make available to the scholar different uh, areas of research. Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Alberto. And Emiliano, you you mentioned also interaction alongside the identification, integration, and interpretation. But would that mean that the, 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 the kind of research cycle would be different in 10 years from now with the support of machines and AI, et cetera? I would say that uh, it's very difficult to, to make a prophecy, uh, but uh, what uh, I, I feel that it could be uh, a possible future for our uh, field of research is that uh, we will be uh, mostly uh, uh, dealing with digital sources, digital tools, digital methodologies, digital whatever, I mean. Because the, the kind of sources, the kind of the methodologies that we used uh, in the car game that we currently use will be, if not replaced, but uh, will be uh, um, also uh, uh, doubled by uh, other uh, digital, digital uh, uh, equivalent. So the point is that, uh, to recall what uh, uh, my colleagues uh, told before me, that we are uh, in, in, a, in a situation where we are going more and more into digital. And the point is that 
we still be able to create uh, some kind of culture where traditional scholars that have a very, very high grade of expertise in uh, uh, the sources that they are working on, the tools they are working with, they should be able to acquire and to strengthen uh, uh, the kind of expertise they need in order to manage the digital research process, because otherwise it will be part of the research will be done uh, with uh, surgical tools, uh, the analog, the analog uh, tools that they are really expert in using. Part of the research, maybe interpretation or, or other crucial uh, uh, tiles in the workflow will be black boxy, black boxed. So you give data to a machine, a tool, uh, uh, something, and you will be relying on the fact that the machine was able to treat the, uh, the data in the right manner, but you have nothing like the right manner. It, ne it never uh, exists something like this. So, uh, it's uh, something is related to uh, artificial intelligence. So the machines uh, inject, injecting intelligence into researchers, but on the other side is also related to injecting the expertise and the intelligence of the researchers into the tools and into the environments. So it's a two uh, a twofold. Um, kind of problem. And uh, okay. it will be very yeah. difficult to say what will be in 10 years. Okay. A case or others on, on these black box and the interaction? Uh, Slava? Well, well, first of all, I, I totally agree with uh, Emiliano that it is necessary to not forget uh, and not ignore skill sets uh, from previous eras. Those have not become redundant. Uh, they need to be there. Uh, and they need to be integrated uh, with new technologies that uh, may actually even make those old uh, technologies more productive. Um, so as far as training is concerned, yes, I think it's very important that we don't only train specialists, but that we train just the, the rank and file, if you want to call it that way, uh, of researchers in the social sciences and humanities uh, to a level of understanding uh, of what digitation, uh, uh, digital science and, and all of that implies and also what it does not imply. Because one of the biggest risks that I uh, see and that I see already developing to some extent is the extension of the current existing, call it culture wars, um, which you see play out in everyday life uh, in debates about vaccination and all of that, um, to the, 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 the growth of that, to a divide uh, between uh, digital science and or digitized science or however you want to call it on the one hand and others on the other hand, uh, and that it will in that respect become suspect for some if you don't do digital or that it becomes suspect for others if you do digital research. Um, and I think that is uh, a evolving uh, and, and not, not productive uh, schism that uh, seems to be uh, developing in uh, our scientific communities. And so to some extent, I think our task is not only to train ourselves and to train our students uh, and next generations, but also to guard against such a bifurcation, which would be more ideological than anything else. Okay, thank you. I go to Slava and then to, to Ami. So Slava, should we train machines? But no, your well, comments, please. Well, I don't know what will happen to the profession of data scientists or to researchers in 10 years time, but I'm really sure that uh, uh, data manage management should become the sh essential part of the study because, uh, you know, to, to, to have successful uh, projects, we just need to use some commons and obviously uh, infrastructural parts can become our commons. 
And uh, speaking about EOSC, uh, now we are very developing external functionality to uh, support control vocabularies and uh, ontologies. And uh, it, it doesn't happen in isolation. So we are also talking to people from um, Australia, from United States, from all the countries that are just coming together to see it on the virtual table. And uh, we're discussing how to make this uh, possible to integrate for all countries and after to train people to use this functionality. So um, I really believe that uh, data management is a, is a kind of key to success in the future. Okay, Ami? Um, sure, I can uh, just add a quick point about kind of the training aspect. Um, so for our data community, being part of something like Shock or even EOS has been really valuable uh, because we, we as a data community have more or less kind of the knowledge or expertise when it comes to doing research, but not so much, or we're still learning um, about concepts like the FAIR principles. And it's actually thanks to uh, colleagues in Work Back 6 of Shock, the training kind of focus one, that we've been able to connect with the relevant experts. And we've been able to invite them to to help train our, our our researchers who are part of the data community to understand how you actually go about implementing FAIR. And so this colleague showcased real tools that the UKDA, for example, has developed that they can use for their respective research. We've also been able to leverage the same colleague to then uh, come and do a, a training school for young and emerging researchers so that we're not only just uh, focused on the people who are researchers and established researchers now, but we're also thinking about the future of the development of our research community. Okay, thank you. Um, looking at the clock, we are reaching the almost the end of, of our meeting. Um, and if I may try, I won't try to summarize, but 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 so, some issues popping up is um, the the connecting the data, finding context of, of, of data. Um, I think also what, what Ami was just saying, the, the power of communities. Let, let's not forget that we, uh, we, we, we need to find the right connections among each other. And yes, they, they may, be, may become more interdisciplinary, but it's, I think in, in, in research, it's, uh, it's not the machines, it's, it's the people, it's the humans that, 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 that come up with new ideas, new inventions. And yes, with the help of machines, uh, find, finding connections and, and, and finding a way through this data deluge, uh, which is, is, is coming up. Um, I also was, what, what struck me was um, the digital fading away we are so focused on what we do with the current data and we just assume that the data will be there forever forever as alberto said uh, the who the, the, the commodore uh, computer it had tapes uh, and uh, I, I i'm old enough also to to to, to re remember this uh, this uh, noise of uh, of of recording um and that's not that long ago. If you compare it in, in the humanities, if you talk 100 or 200 years. So keeping or preventing the digital information fading away should also be on the agenda and, and not just uh, assuming that the data are, are already available. And to a perhaps lesser extent, what I see in, in, in social sciences especially is that the data creation process, the, the surveys and making these surveys uh, uh, comparable on a European scale. So the data creation is the massive part of the work. It's the most expensive part of the work. And, and we should invest in, in high quality already in the data design and the data collection before we talk about uh, FAIR and, and, and uh, uh, finding and, and reading data and, and reusing data. Um, one to, to, to chew on is um, uh, that I want to, to, to mention is digital twins. This is something coming up in environment science. Uh, I think they have digital earth or digital twin of the earth. Um, would this concept also be something for social sciences and humanities to have digital twins of our uh, 
subjects uh, for study. Um, but I leave it to this question uh, as I think I shall now, I'm looking at Marike, shall I now give back to Irena or Rob? Um, so we are now, uh, thanks, thanks everyone, uh, by the way, for, for this beautiful discussion. It's, it was really, really engaging and really enlightening. Um, <clears throat> we are now moving to the closing uh, session. Rob, I think you are already online, so let me... Uh, stop. Let, 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 let me first thank the panelists. Yeah, uh, exactly. I really like this discussion, not because I was the moderator, but uh, because of the content. Uh, so thank you, everybody. Thank you all for the questions. And um, I think let, let's see and find, let's meet in 10 years at least and then see <laughs> whether we were right. <laughs> okay, back to Marika and Rob. Thanks, Ron. Thanks, everyone on the, on the panel. Thanks on, for this discussion. Rob, I think uh, I need to give uh, the presenting rights to you um, yes. for this next session. So uh, we're now ready for uh, the, the final session of these three and a half days. They were really beautiful. Um, so I'm stopped. Yes, exactly. Okay, so I suppose you can see my screen. Yes. Is that right. Okay, so um, I suppose uh, it's now time to close the session, but uh, before we close the entire event, please uh, hang around because the, the coordinators will be uh, just giving a few, let's say, closing remarks. But also, we're going to announce the winners, uh, firstly, of whoever are the most active uh, participants in this event, as well as uh, the winner of the EOSC Projects Expo. But first, before that, uh, some insights from the event. Um, so. Firstly, uh, the audience and visitors seem to have really enjoyed the conference program and the overall event. Um, actually, in these, uh, um, in these difficult times, it has really been a challenge to keep everyone's virtual attention, you know, with back-to-back -back calls, meetings, workshops, webinars, um, and so on. So uh, we in EOSC Hub, Shock, and Freya were conscious of providing a refreshing venue and platform for everyone. Um, and perhaps recapture at least even just a little bit of the exchanges and interactions that we have um, in physical events. Uh, fun fact, uh, the European Open Science Center building, which is currently hosting us now, um, is actually modeled after a real life location. So I leave it up to the attendees to guess where it could be. Um, now on to some uh, insights from the event. So overall, we've had more than 690 participants. And this is from across 45 different countries, including from 20 countries that are outside the EU. So this is actually a truly international event with participants, not just from almost all the EU countries, but from as far as Azerbaijan, Canada, Pakistan, Colombia, Chile, Japan, Taiwan, and even South Africa. As for highlights of the EOSC Projects Expo, we had 33 booths, and this generated a total of 3,780 booth visits, 880 video views, and 1,520 plus document views. So it's a great success for the dissemination of results across the various projects and initiatives. Also for the sessions in the conference program, we had a total of 30 sessions. Um, and uh, we had a total of 190 views on our biggest session. Interestingly as well, um, a total of 1,095 messages were exchanged um, across the lounge area, the chat groups, as well as individual messages of the participants to each other. So uh, those were some insights from the event. Um, now I'll be sharing who are the most active participants. Christmas is coming a little bit early, so we're actually distributing some gifts uh, to these uh, active participants according to our leaderboard. So firstly, in, uh, for the fifth place, uh, whoever is in the fifth place will win a choice of a poster or a print from the Rijksmuseum, courtesy of Shock. And the winner is Anna Mano. Uh, congratulations. So that's, uh, your, you'll be receiving your choice of a poster from the Rijksmuseum. Up next, uh, in fourth place, a bamboo laptop table, courtesy of EOS Cub. That's 
basically to help you work from home, perhaps in a more comfortable seat, uh, wherever you wish. And the winner of that is Yin Chen. So congratulations. Up next in third place, ever yours, the essential letters of Vincent van Gogh from Schock. The winner is Cecile Nice. congratulations. Next, in second place, the Schoenheiser video conferencing headphones, courtesy of the EOS Cup project, to help you uh, carry out your video conferences at home. And the winner is Luke Baruta, congratulations. Finally, in first place, uh, who stands to win a Kindle e-reader, courtesy of the EOS Secretariat project, congratulations, Anna Wallach. So the organizers will get in touch with the winners for their prizes. Um, congratulations once more. Now for the EOS Projects Expo, we have a best booth contest. And the criteria is 30% public voting coming from the total number of votes collected by the voting system. 30% goes to the soundness of content, 25% on relevance clarity, and the clarity of messages, and 15% for the design, visuals, and attractiveness. Our panel of judges include Ver Veronica Heider, who is the acting deputy head of ALSA, the Austrian uh, Social Science Data Archive, a political scientist by training. She joined ALSA to support researchers in searching and reusing data. As part of SHOCK, Veronica contributes to the communication and dissemination work package. Also in the panel is Matti Hegerinen, who is the strategy and innovation officer at EGI, working on diverse uh, set of innovation and strategy management activities. He's also the innovation manager of EOS Cup, concerned with the exploitation and dissemination of results. Also in the panel is Rene Van Horik, who is a project manager for DANCE. He's an expert in the field of research data management, and he's involved in Freya, EOS Cup, Shop, and Ferris Fair. So, uh, the runner up for the best booth of the EOS Projects Expo is It's a Tie uh, between Envy Fair and Fair for Health Research, submitted by Magdalena Bruce from IPOS and Celia Alvarez Romero from the Andalusian Health Service. Congratulations. For the first runner up uh, for the best booth of the EOS Projects Expo, it's the EOS Digital Innovation Hub by, uh, submitted by Elisa Kauhe of the EGI Foundation. So congratulations. And finally, for the best booth of the EOS Projects Expo, just a quick reminder that the winners will win an Amazon Echo Dot up to a maximum of three uh, for the exhibitors but also uh, their materials will be circulated to all the attendees of this event uh, via email. And the winner is the Nianias project uh, submitted by Danielle Martinez of the Nianias project. Congratulations. Uh, so we will get in touch with you uh, with regards to your prizes um, and congratulations. So now um, I would like to pass the floor to our project coordinators for some quick messages, um, some uh, ideas and perhaps uh, some uh, insights that stood out the most for them. Perhaps uh, we can start with uh, Tiziana Ferrari, who is the coordinator of EOSCA. So, hello everyone. Um, so it's a pleasure to be here in this uh, closed and plenary and uh, to see many of you uh, connected. Um, I will keep my summary very short. I was uh, looking at the program uh, once again. I've uh, personally enjoyed the mix of uh, technical topics, uh, user-centric uh, presentations, and also um, a wealth of uh, policy topics that we have been uh, enjoying through the program. So first, um, I think uh, this program uh, shows how many touch points we have across projects and how we can learn from each other, building synergies at all levels in our human networks uh, and our technical achievements and endeavors. 
Um, I perhaps just a personal expression of uh, appreciation. I, I really liked um, the sessions with user presentations, um, the experience of the research projects which are being supported uh, by our collaborations in uh, making use of EOSC and becoming EOSC a reality from a user perspective. Um, also, a lot of appreciation from me um, about the user presentations we had today. Um, I think they were inspiring and, and they showed the potential of EOSC for, for social sciences and humanities, but I could see in many of the things which were touched upon today, uh, how all the topics would quickly expand to other clusters and other research infrastructures and projects. Um, so just to conclude, um, I enjoyed in this uh, program, uh, this uh, user focus and uh, making the users uh, at the center. I think this is something which has emerged uh, in many, many sessions. Um, what I've appreciated is that all the projects together, Shock, Freya and EOSCOB are now concretely bringing results into the EOSC community for their exploitation. I think now we are at the right point in time to, to bring these results to the users. So I think this event was a nice turning point for me where we can really start thinking about from design implementation to adoption. So thanks to all of, uh, of you who contributed to the program and uh, spent the time in preparing interesting presentations. Thank you very much, Tiziana. Now I'd like to pass the floor to Simon Lambert. Yes, uh, yes, thank you, Rob. Um, and thanks to everyone involved in the organization of this conference, uh, which I found personally very rewarding. A um, couple of observations I'd, I'd like to make. Um, one of them is about the, uh, the prominence of, of FAIR in the program, uh, looking at the schedule of, of, of sessions uh, and, and talks, you can see that the, the word FAIR in capital letters um, comes up over and over again, um, which I think is, is uh, very significant. I mean, there is not necessarily any direct connection between EOSC and FAIR, but I mean, clearly there is a, a very strong synergy uh, and it's good to see that being realized uh, in practice uh, uh, and especially in the context of this, this conference of how FAIR has come to have such a, a prominent place in our conception of the EOSC. Um, the other thought I had was about um, uh, what we can do with the EOSC in terms of uh, enabling us, I mean, well, I say us, I mean, uh, researchers in, in any field, whatever it may be, uh, to do to do the things that we've done before, but to do them better in the sense of faster or more reliably or more reproducibly uh, or with uh, better long term preservation. Um, and then uh, going beyond that, the possibility of doing things that haven't been done before enabled through EOSC. Uh, so that would be quite a uh, a success for EOSC if 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 it was one day the marketplace was was sufficiently developed that researchers in some field could find resources or services that they had been unaware of before uh, and would meet their needs um, uh, in a in a way that they perhaps simply couldn't have done before. Uh, so that's what I mean by doing new things using the EOSC to make discoveries about resources and services that that enable new things to be done not just making doing old things better although that's certainly valuable in itself um, using EOSC and its discovery services its portal and its marketplace to to uh, enhance research in that kind of way I think would be quite an achievement so thank you thank you very much Simon and finally Ron Yes, uh, thank you, Rob. Um, well, f first of all, thank you very much to the organizers because I think this this uh, uh, expo, the conference, the, it, it, it's a benchmark. It 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 will be the first of of this expo uh, with the boots. Um, I think that this will be uh, reused uh, a lot. Um, so, congrats on 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 this innovation. Um, it's also the um, it it shows the the broad 
the broad, the, the ecosystem that EOS uh, really is. And I have to admit, I, I didn't uh, visit uh, many of, of, the, of, of the meetings as I was also in the Gaia X meeting, which is, let's say, uh, the, the commercial cloud uh, initiative. And not surprisingly, but, but still, um, key words popping up there was sovereignty of the data, interoperability, trust, data spaces. So I think what, what we are doing in, in, in science and what industry is doing is, is coming very close together. And I, I, I want to agree with Tiziana on repeating this. Uh, this is now an initi initiative by, by EOS Hub Freya and Shock, but the, 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 the cluster projects will continue at least for one or two years. And I think that this would be something to, to, to stay where we have combination of e-infras, of, of uh, facilities, of, of data uh, clusters, science clusters. Uh, and I think this, this meeting, four-day meeting, it shows the, the power of communities. And I think we should nourish and foster this. So thank you all. And um, I would say see, see you next where is next year somewhere somehow, but uh, with an expo. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. I suppose with that we can close uh, today's event. Uh, thank you once again to all our attendees um, and and especially the, the panelists, the chairs, um, and and the and the speakers who have worked hard uh, as well to make to make this uh, event a reality. Indeed, as Ron said, and, and the other chairs, uh, see you in the next event. And with that, I think we can close and have lunch. Uh, the exhibition will still be open. So if, if you're free, please uh, don't hesitate to stop by. Bye, everyone, and thank you. Goodbye, everyone. Thanks. <laughs>